everyone. Welcome to Looking to the East. I'm your host, uh, Dr. Steven Zerker. I'm uh, broadcasting this morning from Kobe, Japan. And uh, we're going to be talking about a very interesting subject for this particular show. Uh, I've noticed in uh, looking at the news in the United States over the last few weeks that the popularity of our, the former president of the United States continues to be quite strong within a relatively broad segment of the U.S. voting population, the U.S. population overall. And um, it got me thinking about the United States and the evolution of our democracy. And I began to question in my mind whether or not the United States could potentially follow in the footsteps of many other countries around the world, and that is move more towards authoritarianism. Uh, Trump has often indicated that he would like to become a dictator, that uh, he is the person that uh, his followers should follow and listen to. So there's signal signs that the United States has the potential to move in that direction. Now, obviously, Trump lost the election, although his followers don't believe that. <clears throat> and uh, I was just reading that there's going to be an, a second inauguration next uh, month, uh, which is remarkable. But uh, again, that segment of the population eventually believes Trump will become president and move into that dominant role. So as I began to think about this, I said, well, who can I get as a guest uh, who could help me answer these questions that I have in my mind, whether or not this is really possible, or am I just fearing the shadows and the United States would not move in that direction because we're a democratic uh, country. So I contacted uh, Professor Mark Kogan. So Mark is with us this morning from his home. Thank you so much, Mark, for being with us, getting up early uh, on a Tuesday morning here in Japan and participating. Good morning. Mark is an uh, associate professor at Kansai Gaida University. He's been teaching there for five years now. He focuses on peace and conflict studies. And uh, what really triggered uh, my decision to contact him and ask him about this is that he teaches a class on authoritarianism. It's called Tyrants, Dictators, and- Strongmen. So, strongmen, yeah. So he's been teaching that class for a number of years. So he focuses on authoritarianism in Asia, where I, I read the, in his, description of his class, 50% of the countries in Asia have never been a democracy. They've followed this authoritarian role. So Mark, welcome to the show. Again, thank, thank you, you very for much for having me. Yeah, <clears throat> let's start with uh, defining what authoritarianism is, and then maybe you could give some examples sure. of countries in Asia that follow this model, like China comes to mind and Singapore comes to mind. Uh, there's many examples. Sure. So, so there's there's a number of um, definitions of what an authoritarian typology uh, would look like, uh, but a classic definition um, by uh, Samuel Huntington, uh, one of the famous uh, uh, authors who wrote uh, the Third Wave, uh, talking about the, the third wave of democratization around the world. We're now, of course, in a democratic recession, but his. <laughs> idea of an authoritarian regime is rule not by uh, popular uh, elected leaders, but by a single leader or uh, um, a third party. And that there would be um, limited political pluralism, meaning the free flow of ideas, um, um, cultures, um, ideologies within a society. And there would be um, a limited um, mobilization or the ability for people to mass mobilize um, on issues of, of their concern or special interests. And there would be um, some use, uh, a minor use of, of propaganda or even uh, small acts of, of state terrorism uh, to, to um, repress a population. Um, but authoritarian regimes are not um, all the same. Um, sometimes an ideology is stronger, but generally um, ideologies are weak. Um, political pluralism, uh, like uh, the use of political parties, um, have a role in society. There are opposition political parties that are permitted to exist. Um, civil society 
uh, still has a role to play. Um, and um, the regime itself does not seek to exact total control over society in general. Um, so uh, if you look at it that way, um, you have a kind of authoritarian um, uh, topology. But I think a better question is what's a democracy, right? So anything that falls short of a kind of minimum standard uh, or a topology of democracy could be uh, classified as someone who, or, or some, a state that is sliding slowly into authoritarianism. You put it on a kind of continuum. So, you know, these things are quite uh, simple and there are lots of different um, uh, definitions out there. So the presence of free and fair elections, um, people who are of uh, adult age, 18 to 21 or whatever, have the right to vote. Anyone has the right to vote uh, and can vote if they want to without interference. And then the right of people who are popularly elected to take power once that election is over, meaning the election has some sort of consequence. So we can start there in our analysis of whether or not uh, the United States is sliding slowly um, into authoritarianism. Yeah, I think those are some interesting uh, characteristics that you point out there. And um, I will get into this, I think, in a few more minutes, but uh, it seems like the United States may be failing on some of those those markers for what a democracy is, which would then potentially uh, predict that the United States is moving more towards that model. But let's let's go back to uh, Asia. Can you give an example for the viewers of uh, a, a, an authoritarian regime which doesn't meet the metrics that uh, you had just mentioned? For example, elections and yeah. so forth. What would you what, what what country would you say was a the best example of that type, that particular type of uh, government format. Yeah, well, I think that um, there there are a couple of examples, and they they are representative of how different authoritarian regimes really are. Okay, there are authoritarian regimes, there are hybrid regimes, there are totalitarian states. Uh, mm. but we're talking about a, a a classic authoritarian type uh, state. Um, two examples of those are. Singapore uh, and right. Thailand, right? So the oh, Singaporean really? model of <laughs> governance uh, has been kind of highly touted in the East. There was a, a conversation in the mid nineties about um, um, Asian values and whether or not a Singaporean model uh, was more applicable to East Asia uh, than Western style democracy was. Um, Singapore is an example of a country that has high economic growth, uh, one of the more wealthy countries um, in the region. It has political parties. It has uh, largely free and fair uh, elections. People who want to vote can vote. And then the ruling party, um, once it's elected, takes power. Um, the problem with Singapore what makes it um, an authoritarian regime is that there are a number of areas um, in terms of elections, in terms of the media, in terms of um, uh, the legislature, uh, not so much the judiciary, uh, that um, make it fall uh, back so much. For example, for many, many years, uh, the, the um, long time Prime Minister of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, um, his uh, PAP, People's Action Party, um, won every single election. So every single- yeah, and, As I recall, because yeah. I've been in and out of Singapore, it, it wasn't even close, right? It was- No, it's never close. 80% or 90% yeah. in the- so There was a token, the, a token yeah. minority so there, there, party. There would, be, there would be opposition parties uh, who competed uh, in election, but- because um, the, the, um, the one, the philosophy uh, of uh, governance was, was quite popular. People were to a certain extent ex happy with the exchange. Uh, but- oh, yeah, Mark, let me stop you there because I, I think that's an interesting point. 
the exchange being economic success yes. and loss of political freedom. Yes, yeah, so so to speak, yes. Okay, I just want to yeah. make that clear because that's that's what my observation that uh, Singaporeans are more interested in wealth than they are in democracy. Yeah. Maybe that's too simplistic, but anyway, it was a trade-off that they made, and many countries make that trade-off too. Yeah. So the, the, the thing about Singapore is that, that the opposition political parties, even though they contested the election, so to speak, right, the opposition leaders um, were often jailed uh, or uh, under sort of uh, great coercion. Um, right. They didn't have access uh, to media uh, during the election periods. And the, um, the way they, the, the campaigns uh, are funded um, they were under greater scrutiny uh, than um, the, 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 the PAP. And journalists uh, in the country, uh, not from elections, but in, in, in the realm of the fourth estate, uh, were treated uh, quite poorly, uh, threatened with uh, legal action, um, uh, heavily censored. Um, there's a, a was for, uh, for a, a, a great long time. Um, a kind of uh, media control uh, going on in the country. And then, of course, the second example, to trying to be more concise here, is Thailand. I have to stop you there, because I think the, the perception in the West, I don't know where this comes from, is that Thailand's a democracy. Well, that's stupid. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, Thailand, well, okay. Thailand, holds, <laughs> Thailand holds uh, free and fair elections, haha, <laughs> so to speak. It holds elections. But they're certainly not free, uh, and they're certainly not fair. Um, for example, uh, recently, um, Thailand held its um, uh, March 1920 election, but the March 19 tw March 2019 elections, uh, the election was stacked um, by the new constitution, um, which gives a favorable percentage um, to the military, uh, to the police. So the electoral, the, the, the sort of uh, legislative sort of uh, math is stacked in favor of a coalition party or a group of parties that are um, backing the military junta or the military back uh, government. Mm -hmm. uh, routinely, uh, in Thailand, and I'm not even talking about the worst kinds of abuses in Thailand. I'm talking about the garden variety abuses, right? Um, when the government feels that um, an issue is of uh, um, um, injury to national security or threatens the monarchy, um, um, media organizations will be shut down, uh, closed, or threatened. Uh, journalists in the past have, have been imprisoned or simply um, uh, disappeared. Um, the, uh, the referendum itself on Thailand's constitution, which was largely written uh, by the monarchy and uh, military drafters, uh, so to speak, there was a, um, kind of silencing of dissent. Uh, people were not allowed to campaign uh, against it. Uh, anyone who was um, voicing criticism of the referendum uh, were threatened and sometimes jailed uh, for um, that kind of simple kind of dissent. Um, right. So Thailand, you know, has free and fair elections, but it fails every other test. So the question now, I suppose, is does the United States fit into any of these kinds of categories? Well, I have to say that some of the things that you've mentioned as the uh, hallmarks of Singapore and Thailand are applicable. Certainly, the persecution of journalists I, under the Trump administration, that was a daily barrage. I, they didn't end up in jail, but they were called traitors and enemies of the state. So that particular aspect of uh, Singapore and also Thailand is evident in the United States. That's that's always been a struggle in the U.S. I, I, but, but I, I kind of disagree with you. I, oh, I you do? Okay. Agree with you. Go ahead. Uh, because um, there isn't. Um, you know, yes, journalists are criticized uh, in the United States, and the um, um, the rankings, press freedom rankings in the United States under the Trump administration, fell quite dramatically. 
but the press still has the ability to to report the news right um journalists are not imprisoned right um, there's full exercise full control uh well, yeah i wasn't, that, I wasn't that kind of thing. Was the however the only difference is that there was increased media criticism. So people, you know, the, the demonization or the dehumanization of journalists in America was on the rise, which, you know, if left untreated, right, could have left, uh, led to uh, violence, right? Not okay. just extreme rhetoric by the president and extreme rhetoric uh, and, and sentiment by his supporters. Uh, I mean, Donald Trump, of course, um, but it could have led to violence. Right. Yeah, I think there were some instances of uh, journalists being attacked by the Trump supporters and crowds. But it was nothing like, I agree with you, it was nothing like uh, going to jail and disappearing. Right. Or, or having your entire... No, uh, no, no forced disappearance. Being sued into bankruptcy, which I know Singapore used to do as well. They would just sue these journalists or opposition politicians to the point where they, they had no money left whatsoever. And that was one... This was something that Trump... This is what something that Trump had been in favor of for, for a very long time, which was changing the liable laws. Uh, right, in, exactly. In States, uh, which had made it easier to target journalists. Um, but that never, of course, had happened. And it so let's, let's pivot to survived this. a First Amendment challenge. Sure. So let's, let's pivot then to the United States. So we have a, a definition of what authoritarianism is, even though it's quite broad, and there's different representations of it, as you point out. That's true. Yeah. But we have the example of Singapore, which is based on economics, perhaps a trade-off, people giving up political freedom. It's, it's kind of with their consent. Although I think it's slowly changing in Singapore. I, I've read that there's maybe a greater interest in democracy. But anyway, then you talked about Thailand, where things are pretty much dictated by the monarchy and also the military. So. Let's apply that then to the United States. Uh, these characteristics, where do you see the United States signaling or moving in the direction of these other states in Thailand and Singapore? And maybe where, for example, uh, is the United States clearly not at risk for moving in that direction? Because those, those characteristics are still freely defended and are democratic in nature. How would you, I mean, it's a tough question, Mark, I, I understand, but how would you do it at a broad level? Well, I, I would say that you know there was a there was a scholar uh, about 20 years ago, uh, 2002, 2003. Uh, Stephen Levitsky um, wrote a book uh, about something called competitive authoritarianism, and he he used uh, four uh, areas of what they call democratic contestation, right? And we'll talk about a few of them, right? The media is one of them, right? So. In the United States, uh, in any kind of um, liberal democracy, you need a free and fair press, and people need access to information and also access to alternative information. Meaning, if the government is in control of the media, right, you need a secondary source. You can't just buy what the government is telling you, so to speak, right? Um, in that area of contestation, um, have there been any kind of movements away from a free and, and fair uh, press? Um, and you could make the case uh, that the free press in the United States is slowly sliding back uh, as evidenced by its you know, deterioration of uh, its uh, freedom of the press rankings by Reporters Without Borders. Um, but um, there is greater media monopoly. Um, so you have these, the presence of, of uh, television networks like, like Fox News or uh, Newsmax, uh, these sort of injurious um, right-wing platforms, uh, or you have greater um, political uh, polarization, even in, uh, among um, media networks in, in the United States. Um, and, um, you could also argue that when it comes to information, um, social media companies like, like Facebook aren't uh, doing enough to combat the spread of partisan uh, fake news or disinformation mm. online, right? So has there been 
violations or sort of uh, incursions into uh, that uh, free and fair um, uh, press um, in the United States, I'd say uh, very little, uh, but the vulnerabilities are still there, right? Greater media concentration, right? Partisanship in, in um, 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 television networks, uh, harassment threatening uh, of journalists. But as long as the free press right, is able to do its job without uh, uh, interference, uh, I don't see any kind of um, 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 change. Uh, okay. America still uh, meets all the categories of having a free and fair press. Uh, mm. Other areas of contestation, right, like elections, right? I say you have a real, some real evidence, right? Because you have an election in 2020, um, millions, I mean, millions of people vote. Uh, um, Joe Biden got, what, 81 million votes and Trump got about 74 million, right? right? There were, uh, there was a result in all 50 American states, right? Uh, some of those states were close, Arizona, Pennsylvania, right? Uh, and some of the, the results were challenged, right? Uh, and particularly in Arizona, particularly in, in Pennsylvania and, uh, and Georgia, of course, right? Yeah. Trump went through 60 or more uh, legal challenges um, to, to those uh, election results. All but I think one of those legal challenges, right? He lost, right? The, he was entitled to recounts under law, right? He paid for recounts uh, as under law and the machine count and the hand counts were virtually identical. They're never probably ever gonna be the same, but you know, within you know, a very, very, very sort of razor margin, the same. Not enough to upset the outcome um, or the result. So um, the problem with it is he was not willing to accept uh, the result. And he was able to um, persuade people that um, the election was stolen from him. And on January 6th, um, there was a kind of uh, insurrection or a kind of authoritarian fantasy uh, played out on the steps of the Capitol um, where, um, for the first time, people thought, well, maybe um, people aren't going to accept the actual results of the election, that there would be, um, you know, um, something else. I don't know what, what, they were, what they were fantasizing about, of course, uh, yeah. some kind of military regime, some kind of uh, authoritarian regime run by Trump. Um, uh, I think so. Yeah, if you, if you look at the... At the yeah, the, the, the posters and the signs, it was clear that there was a personal allegiance to him above and beyond the democratic election. Yeah. So, so journalism, you're, you're saying the signs are not there, that we still have a free and fair press, and what happens in Singapore and Thailand is not have, You still have yeah. uh, free and fair elections, but sometimes, it, it, for the first time in, in, um, in a very, very long time, since the 1870s, uh, you have... Uh, um, people who are not happy with the result. Yeah, hey Mark, we, we're running out of time and we actually, we got some okay. questions coming in here. Oh, that's great. So, yeah, <clears throat> so this question here, I'll go ahead and read it to you. Uh, in a recent article titled, First as a Farce, Then as a Tragedy, um, the nine US division perpetuates Trumpism's delusions. Philosopher Salvo Zizek, you ever heard of that person? Oh, you have, okay. Argued that there are at least 30 million Americans that are ready for a dictator, partly because of the cognitive decline in the United States. Oh, that's a huge issue. Anti-science, anti-reason, uh, reason. and I would, this is not in the question, but I would also put in fundamentalism because evangelical religious types are ones who tend to make up a large segment of the Trump supporters. Sure. So actually, this question is what caused me to do this show. What is the question? Is that, that there is, he's saying that there's a segment of the American population that would want to move in this direction. And he's estimating oh, okay. 30 million people. Yeah. It's not just a ragtag group that we saw invading the Capitol since the first time right. since 1812.
but there's a huge population out there that would reject democracy if Trump was to become the, you know, the, the, the leader. Yeah. Uh, okay. My, 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 my response is that um, I think there's some valid validity there. Uh, and I think it has to do with personality characteristics. Um, there was a, uh, an author or a, a political scientist by the name of Karen Stenner, who wrote a book uh, primarily uh, uh, about something called latent authoritarianism. Uh, and mm -hmm. the idea was that, you know, people um, um, don't really identify readily as um, authoritarians. They wouldn't uh, readily admit that. But the um, when faced with circumstances like um, changes, like sea changes in uh, social and, and political norms. Uh, in 2016, uh, people galvanized uh, pr quite quickly around Donald Trump and early Republicans in the South Carolina primary at that particular point in time had uh, largely decided in favor of Trump and they never wavered uh, from then on. Uh, so it's, it's a question of those characteristics. So, you know, people are, are fear, they fear uh, wholesale changes uh, in society. They um, are worried about external threats, whether that be from Muslims um, or uh, threats to their economic livelihoods. Um, that, that foreigners, immigrants um, are, are, are so-called stealing their jobs, you know, uh, kind of uh, economic fragility. Uh, or uh, anxiety, um, it makes them make extreme uh, choices. Uh, Trump tapped into that, uh, those kind of personality characteristics, and he also sort of uh, um, tapped into a kind of populist uh, moment where he could paint uh, individuals um, that threaten American norms and American traditions and American way of life as something dangerous to society. So he kind of created these, you know, the sort of um, um, favorite in-group and a very, very sort of deviant uh, out-group. Um, that's the classic sort of populist formula. Um, but there are also personality characteristics that 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 kind of make up this. Uh, you know, a a rejection of reason, uh, simplistic thinking. Uh, on the part of people, you know, as, as the the, uh, the commenter said, uh, a, a disbelief in science and reason, right? The the higher highest percentage of people who who voted for Trump were people without a college degree, right? right? Hey, Mark, like yeah, do uh, we're uh, Melissa? I know we're running a little bit over time, but I want to go over because I want to get to this next question. Just one minute on this, Mark. It's kind of interesting. So he talks about the management of government and democracies yeah. are, are challenging yeah. to actually manage well. That if you look at Singapore, despite the trade-off, the, the, the lack of democracy there, it's run more efficiently. That is certainly true. For example, their government officials get paid hundreds of thousands of dollars. You know, when they invest in their government and they get the brightest people to make the decisions and so forth. So the question is, should we change our tumultuous democracy to a more improved management for the United States, can our democracy get better, maybe technically or so forth? And is democracy sustainable if we don't make that change? That's the question. One minute only, Mark. I'm sorry, that's another tough question. Short. Yeah, it, but it, it's not that all that difficult to answer. But I, my, I think my response is I would answer with the question: um, mm. What kind of uh, management changes are needed um, to? Um, um, uh, equal the kind of uh, discipline uh, that Singapore has ha had maintained. Uh, you know, wow. the, that's, the, that's that's tough to answer. Yeah. So 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 you know, people are uh, people say that uh, Singapore is much better managed uh, than the United States, and that you know, well, it's a, a lot more simple of a place to manage. It is a city state, right? Uh, its complexity uh, or its complexities are a little bit different. Uh, what kind of management changes are we talking about? Uh, hmm. um, what kind of democracy changes are, would be necessary? You know, um, <laughs> okay. Let, let me let me let me frame it in a completely uh, different way, right? And and um, I think there probably are. Right? I think that, um, for example, uh, a Singaporean model 
would not work in the United States, right? It simply wouldn't work, right? And some systems simply don't work elsewhere because of a variety of factors. For example, a lot of African democracies, if you wanna call them even flawed democracies, inherited their systems from the West, right? And those systems which worked very well in the United Kingdom, right? When they were protectorates or part of the Commonwealth, they led to catastrophic disasters uh, when those African states uh, declared independence. Uh, this is uh, evidence in Lesotho, where I worst, we used to work before I came to, to Kansai Gaidai. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there are um, uh, economic, uh, social, and cultural factors which complicate uh, um, so the situation, right? But the systems itself, the management of democracy, right? Um, what works for Singapore? Uh, or what works for Brunei or these sort of uh, wealthy uh, authoritarian states won't work for the United States. Just not okay. Possible. It's too complicated. Right, Mark. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, I, I'm a management professor, so I think there could be some things that we can do. But I agree, the wholesale change, as you're talking about, Americans won't even wear masks. Right. Well, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> as we know. Okay, Mark, we could easily go on for another half hour, hour on this. Thank you so much. This has been yeah, so interesting you. and you're so well informed on this topic. Really appreciate it. Uh, thank you to the viewers. And uh, next, uh, my next show is in a couple of weeks. I'm thinking of addressing the issue of women in Japan. There's been some controversy over the last week or so with a high level government official disparaging More. women as business people. So that'll be the next topic in a couple of weeks. So you guys Great can time. tune in, in uh, for that show. Mark, again, thank you so much for taking no time. Problem. Appreciate it. Thank you for the questions from uh, our viewers. Thank you. And uh, that's a wrap. Thank you. See you all next time. Bye-bye, everyone.